Uh, I take this in English because we have people from abroad, from the world, around us. Uh, I'm really happy to be invited here from uh, Toya and Researchers Desk. She's the organizer of Researchers Desk, which is a, it's a community among researchers and experts uh, within climate, earth system science, and other topics concerned to take care about the planet. Uh, I am a glaciologist. Could you raise your hand? All of you have heard the name glaciologist before. Quite a few. So you will know more in about 20 minutes. Okay? So I will now let you in into my frozen world, the cryosphere, as we say in, in uh, this planet. And uh, we'll talk about 800,000 years back in time until now. And uh, it's in, in four chapters. Who am I? You don't know me, I think. And uh, uh, how does a glacier work? What does it eat? What does it um, let out? And uh, different types of glaciers as well. And why do we have to care about the glaciers? They're just cold and dangerous. A lot of crevasses you can fall in and die. Why should we care about them? Uh, and then in the end, what have we learned today? Does it sound okay? And uh, my, my voice is, uh, yeah, great, thanks, a lot of fans already. So, who am I? Uh, actually, uh, when I was young as you, I just loved skiing, have fun, climb in the mountains. And uh, that's where I met Toya. Uh, 150 years ago or so. <laughs> At least. Talk to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we went down into the Alps. We took the train, of course. Nobody could board an aeroplane by then. And it, it's a lot of seasons we were skiing, and uh, we had actually some uh, serious accidents with avalanches, but we survived. So uh, we're still alive. But finally, I found this topic geography in the university and uh, I started to study that uh, you know deserts tropical uh, rainforests and glaciers and I found that these glaciers that I was so fascinated by them so I had to uh, study them more so I went up to Stockholm University and they have a field station up in northern Lapland it's called Tarfala research station it's very close to Kemnekaise which is actually still the highest mountain in Sweden. Not the south summit because it's melting, but the northern summit. And um, so that's what I've been working with most of the years. Uh, latest years I've been working with Earth System Science and Communication and uh, also uh, business development to help companies and organizations to uh, adjust their way of working in harmony with the planet. So, we go further on. Uh, so my, my office for many years was in Kebnekaise Mountain. It's a little valley. It's five glaciers all around there. And you might, you might be surprised that in Sweden we have 250 glaciers. We had 300 in the 90s, just 30 years ago. But now we have 250 left. And they are decreasing very much. And the south summit has melted two meters since last year. So now it's two meters lower than the northern summit. So if you want to go up the Kemikaisa mountain, you have to climb on a ridge with rope, uh, ice axe and crampons on your feet and probably have a guide. So it's a bit more difficult if you go, want to go to the highest summit. So to work on a glacier, you have to be careful. You have to have a rope, crampons and ice axe and to be at least persons in the rope because if someone falls in or to, to a crevasse you have to be able to drag someone up. Uh, in the early 90s I was invited by a professor to uh, work in uh, Antarctica. You know where Antarctica? Where is? Point at Antarctica everyone. Yeah, it's down there. It's about 7,000 kilometers to the earth, but you can go on the surface. So I was there in the, in the early 90s, uh, drilling ice cores, and we were preparing for a big drill project uh, that resulted in the deepest ice core ever made. It came back eight ice ages back in time. So it's 800 years back in time. 
So why do we do that? Why do we drill in an ice sheet? It's 4,000 meters deep. Well, in this ice cores, you have small bubbles, and these bubbles, they consist of air, atmosphere, from that specific time. And by analyzing that atmosphere, you can see what was the composition in that time, and what was the temperature. So you can use the oxygen, oxygen isotopes by uh, creating a temperature curve back in time. It's called a climate proxy. And uh, normally, we, we didn't have thermometers uh, 500,000 years ago, but we have the glaciers, perfect archive. And in Antarctica, the ice doesn't melt in the middle. It just layers, layers, each year, new layers. So that's how you can analyze the, uh, the glaciers. Um, and, but they are actually um, drilling a new core now that will become one and a half million years back in time. So the last two, two million years we had around 20 ice ages. And the normal stage for this place is ice age. That means we have three, four kilometers of ice here. And this is 500 meters below sea surface. That's a normal situation for Stockholm. Now we live in an interglacial between two big ice ages. So we have this warm, pleasant weather, slightly too warm, slightly too fast warming, but it's be between two ice ages. And now, and, and when the last ice age, when we had, that was about 20,000 years ago, the sea level was 120 meters lower than today. So imagine the whole northern sea. It wasn't the northern sea. It was a big landscape with rivers and fields. So it's hard to imagine. But, you know, nature has developed really fast with ice. And so, uh, what is the glacier? I should have said that in the beginning. It's a huge piece of mass that is so thick that it moves by its own weight. So it's, see, if you, don't, if you just have a snow patch that is 20 meters deep and it doesn't move, there's no ice in it, it's no glacier. But when it starts uh, creating ice where air and water cannot run freely and it starts moving in a plastic movement, it's not elastic because it doesn't rebound up to the mountain and it's not vicious like a river but it's plastic so it moves like a, like a dough you know where you make a canel bolar it's like that but no cinnamon no sugar only snow and glaciers they love snow and when it's when it's too hot they melt so that's how the mass balance works you fill up they eat snow and they create that to ice and the ice moves through to the front and then it melts. So the, the front is melting more and more and, and the top is getting thicker. So if it wasn't any movement in the ice, then the, every, every glacier would just tip over. But you have this thing called gravity. You all know that. Gravity makes the, uh, the weight create the movement through the glacier. So if you drop something in Kebnekaise up there, it takes maybe 2000 years for that little piece of, uh, I don't know, backpack or something to come up in the front. So what we are seeing in the front, small pieces of animal and stuff, that was landing on the surface when Jesus was born. And in Antarctica you have several hundred thousand years old ice that comes up. So it's pretty astonishing. You have, it's like the glacier, it's talking to us. The whole nature is talking to us, but you have to learn the language. That's what you do as a glaciologist. You learn the language and then you can interpret what the glacier is telling you by drilling and by doing. And I give you some cold facts, as we say in my branch. So about 10% of the earth is covered by ice. 10% is pretty much. It's about if you have a big sleeping room, that's a whole bed in your sleeping room. Uh, well, 91% of the ice is in Antarctica. Because Antarctica, it's a continent. It's not like Arctic. Arctic, you know, it's floating sea ice. And then you have Greenland. Greenland is an ice sheet. But Antarctica, it's the same size as the whole Europe, whole Northern Sea, the whole Mediterranean. 
and the whole Russia until Ural Mountains, just three, four kilometers thick ice. So if you if you're lost there, it's a long way back home. Uh, and three quarters of the whole freshwater resources is in the ice. So it's really important to save the ice because when it's no rain, you need the meltwater from the from the ice. And if let's say if we continue burning fossil fuels, then the uh, glaciers will melt. They are melting really rapidly now. If they all should melt, then the sea level would rise about 70 meters. That would cover the whole Stockholm. The whole the only thing in Stockholm that would point up above sea level it would be Kaksnäs Tonet and the city hall where they have the Nobel Prize ceremony. All rest covered. Um, but when it was the last ice age, just 20,000 years ago, that wasn't long in a geological perspective. Then 33% of the earth was covered with ice, three times as much. So it's pretty much. I talked about that. Now we have, you know, the, the, I talked about the glacier, how it moves. It eats snow, creates two ice, it moves and melts in, in, the, in the front. So the, you have all these movements, you have an equilibrium line in the middle of a glacier. So why are glaciers so sensitive? They, they are a, like indicator for climate. So for instance now we have 1.2 degrees warmer than a little bit more than 100 years ago because of our emissions. So now this equilibrium line, when it's no melting, no, no plus, no minus, it has rise, you know, you know the temperature uh, decreases but one degree per hundred meters in the mountains. So if you go up in the mountain, thousands of meters up, it's 10 degrees warmer, uh, colder, sorry. So this equilibrium line had rise 120 meters above, you know, the last hundred years. So that means a big chunk of ice is melting right now. So that's the change of the equilibrium line. It's why it's melting. Uh, then you are, well, you, you can see the pictures later on. It's diff different type of glaciers. You have a top glacier, that's Kemnik summit of Kemnikaise. It's like a pyramid. You can go up there and you see 11% of the whole Sweden from the summit. It's really beautiful. I was there last week and we were lucky. You know, the groups before us, they were rushing. They had bad weather. We took it easy, took some fika, drank some water. And when we came up, it was sunny like this. So don't always rush. Wait for nature and it shows the best side. And then you have a niche glacier, like a cirque glacier in a little bowl. That's very common. Then you have a valley glacier, like Stor Glaciär. Stor Glaciär, it's the most examined glacier in the whole world. And the longest mass balance record since 1946. So a lot of researchers, they come to Tarfala in Kebnekaise to study Stuglasjara. Because they know so much, we know so much about it. And then we, they can continue to do their, uh, their enhanced research on it. And then you have ice field or plateau ice. Piedmont Glacier, it's like an elephant foot. It's pretty cool. It's in northern uh, Canada, we have these Piedmont Glaciers. And then you have these ice sheets. Inland seas in Swedish, and they are huge. Still, we have Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, so, why should we care about the glaciers? Well, I love glaciers, but I'm a I'm an ice nerd. So, but why should we care about them? Well, it's all connected because our emissions they create warm heat, and the glaciers melt. Uh, just to compare, you know, the normal emissions of, of fossil carbon is about uh, 1.3 to a half gigaton, a billion tons per year. We emit 40 gigatons, 100 times more than the natural sources. So if somebody says it's natural, it's the cold cycle. Yeah, but we emit 100 times more than all the natural processes, the fossil carbon dioxide. And that creates heat. I go to this. And if you see, in Sweden, these 250 glaciers, they create power, clean power for us, uh, water for uh, irrigation and drinking, 
and also to keep the balance in the nature when it's dry. Uh, in other, in the Andes or even in the Himalayas, you know, it's called the third pole Himalayas with Mount Everest, or Shumalungma as the Nepalese say. Uh, it's glaciers, they are now melting so fast that you have this flood, flash floods, and they are destroying ri uh, rivers, villages, and also power dams. And when they are gone, if we continue emit fossil uh, fuels, then it will be dropped. And it's about 1.7 billion people dependent on the glaciers. And soon, in a couple of decades, it will be two or two and a half billion people dependent on these glaciers. So what should they do if they have no water for irrigation or drinking? Two billion people. Could you imagine don't have access to water? You know, in the tropics they have monsoon and then they have drought. They have no seasons like we have here. And when it's drought for half a year, they have no water. So everything is connected, you understand? Our choices, every ton fossil fuel we emit, creates a worse situation for the glaciers and also for all those billions of people. So that's why the little super specific interest in ice is so important. Uh, I think I stopped there. It's a lot of things to say. I could sit here for hours. I would like to, I would love to take you up to Stor Glacier and to show you the beauty of the glaciers, beauty of the crevasses in a safe way. Because you really feel like your life. You're close to heaven, wonderful views, you get strong legs, and the food tastes is marvelous. And if you're lucky, there's a sauna as well. So, uh, thanks a lot for listening, and I'm eager to hear your uh, questions about things that I missed. take it in English or Swedish and I can just repeat them so because this is recorded for a researchers desk so others can also listen to this yes please yeah 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 that's a good question how can we uh, define the temperature when you drill in the ice well you see uh, oxygen uh, creates of different isotopes so oxygen 16 16 uh, proteins uh, uh, core particles is lighter than oxygen 18 so when it's warm you know all the oxygen leaves the ocean but when it's colder only the light oxygen leaves the oxygen 16 so when it's more oxygen 16 then it means it was colder so it's like climate proxies you and you can check that with uh, temperature records so you can fine-tune it so now they know exactly how to define the temperature changes back in time but that's it that's a good question so the glacier is uh, a perfect climate record if it doesn't melt yes please Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Good question. How, why should we use the glaciers instead of trees and other uh, climate records? You use all kinds of records. And actually, the ice you you can miss some years uh, because it can be melt. It can be uh, shearing. Like when the ice moves, actually sometimes it can shear like that. You have the opposite. So that's why we did this dynamic study. But with trees. It's trees, uh, tree um, year rings in trees. It's actually the only climate archive that you can see each year, and you can compare each year because it depends on temperature and moisture. So you can have these trees to compare with, just to adjust the climate models. And you have these fossil trees in the in the peat bogs, for instance. They can be ten thousand years old, and you can drill in them, and you can measure these tree rings and compare so you have this kind of a puzzle back in time so you can have a perfect climate record through the trees you compare to the glaciers and then sediment cores in the in the lakes and then you create this pattern so you need a lot of data you cannot just take one record and say this is the fact yeah, 
Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. If you compare, how do you compare uh, this? Uh, if you can see different layers, for instance, if you have a big volcano eruption, Krakatoa in, I think it was 1883, you can see a lot of ash layers all around, all glaciers have these ash layers. Uh, also sediment cores in lakes, and so you can also see that it, it was colder by then, because the, the ash layer was covering the UV uh, radiation, so you can see the tree rings, they were smaller by then. Then you can identify that exact year by going back, even if nobody was there, but the nature has these records. So it's a, you have to uh, co-work with a lot of different scientists. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what's happening in Antarctica right now? Yeah, it's uh, like you say, uh, it was a question about Antarctica, and uh, it's really cold. Like in, in the winter, it's maybe 85, 90 degrees Celsius below. Don't go outside. You will, your spit will freeze before it leaves the mouth. Uh, so it's, it's pretty cold there. But, so actually, some parts of Antarctica is growing, because uh, the air, you know, the the surrounding seas, they are getting warmer and warmer, and warm sea uh, leaves more moisture into the atmosphere. And when that moisture comes into the Antarctica, it freezes as snow. So actually some parts of Antarctica is growing, are growing. You can see that through satellites. Uh, but uh, the melting in the fringes, like in the ice shelves, it's so much more, so that you have a pretty awesome negative mass balance in Antarctica. You have about and it loses about 150 billion tons of ice each year, net. So if somebody, you know, there, there are some climate deniers or whatever we should call those, fact resistant, they say that Antarctica is growing. And they are right in one sense. Some parts are growing, but the melt is so much bigger. So you have the melt, net melt is 150 gigatons per year. In Greenland, which is surrounded by more warmer sea and smaller, they're losing 280 billion tons each year. That's twice as much. So actually, some projections for the future is that Greenland is probably lost. It will take hundreds or thousands of years, but it's probably lost. Antarctica might be safe, but it depends on us. Yeah. Yeah, to, uh, the, it was a question about the ice shelves, and ice shelves, it's, a, it's kind of inland ice or ice sheet floating out, and it can be several thousand meters thick, then it, as soon as it reaches water, which has a lot of uh, thermic uh, uh, power, as you say, then it loses, it gets thinner and thinner, and in, in the, the, the most common thickness of the ice shelf in, in the front is about three to five hundred meters thick, and you only see ten percent. Because ice is 10% lighter than water, so 10% is above, then 90% is uh, below. And there's a lot of melt below. And that melting below, we have, researchers have missed that in many years. So they have predicted that, oh, Antarctica seems pretty stable, it's probably growing a bit. But then they started, the Swedish Anna Bolin, she's a Swedish researcher, she has this submarine and she has made these measurements and see that it's melting so fast from below. You don't see that from the surface, but now they know so they have to adjust all the models. So Antarctica is melting so much faster. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, the Gulf. Okay, okay. It was a, a question about the Gulf Stream and, and the melting of the glaciers, and that is really connected. That's a really clever question. Thank you. Good one. Uh, you see that the Gulf Stream is uh, starting in the Caribbean and it's uh, bringing war pretty warm uh, seas, water up to here. That's why we can sit here. If we didn't have the Gulf Stream, it would be like northern Siberia, northern Canada here. You would all have 
coats and, and hats and stuff. So this is the Gulf Stream. But it's weakening now because the, the melting of uh, the Arctic uh, sea ice and uh, especially Greenland is melting so much, 280 billion tons each year. So that you have this fresh water and you know salt water is heavier than the um, fresh water. So when this salt warm water comes from the south and you have a lot of new fresh water that is pretty light then the salt water is pressed down in the deep much further south and that can create a cold spell here. So we, because of global warming we could have much more uh, colder in Scandinavia. That's pretty strange but that's how climate dynamics works. Yes please. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, good question. They talk about the albedo changing because if, if it gets colder, then probably the, the glaciers can uh, grow and we have more snow. And we have more snow, it reflects back the, the, the UV radiation because albedo, high albedo. And that might counteract the global warming. And uh, that is uh, one of the theories. So it's, a, it's a good point. Uh, so if we can change the albedo to more light surface than dark, for instance, if you have a dark forest, then it creates a lot of heat. So for instance, all this, when we plant a lot of, you know, in the forest industry, we plant a lot of coniferous trees like Gran, Otal, pine trees and spruce, then they are dark, it gets warmer. So it, that creates a warmer climate in Sweden. If we would let the uh, deciduous trees, like love thread, like birch and uh, oak, it's more, much more lighter leaves, and that would create a uh, higher albedo, reflect more back. So we should let nature take care of the forest, not the forest industry. That's also creating a climate impact. So you see, everything is connected. Whatever, all choices we do um, affects the climate and our dear glaciers. Clever questions. Yes, please. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, she was asking that if uh, the slowing of the Gulf Stream was actually slowing down or affecting the carbon uptake. Uh, I have to pass on that one because it's a very complicated manner because you have uh, the carbon uptake, uh, the uptake of carbon in the oceans, it has always helped us uh, so that carbon dioxide resolved in the oceans but it also creates, it buffers uh, the carbon dioxide, but now it's saturated with carbon dioxide. So you have such a high level of carbon dioxide with an acidic gas, so the ocean is getting more acid, acidic and cannot buffer anymore carbon dioxide. So I would say that, and that is, uh, is the warming is two to three times more in the Arctic, so I would say that the uh, the possibility for the Arctic Ocean to sequester and take up carbon dioxide getting worse and worse, lesser and lesser. Um, how that is affected by the Gulf Stream is hard to say. Maybe somebody knows. <laughs> so please uh, comment in the, in the video on the internet if you have some answer in the, about Gulf Stream affecting the carbon uptake, please. So we might find the answer on the internet. <laughs> I will be here for a while. Uh, I was. Uh, I, I will have a coffee with a Toya, and I will sit here. I can show you graphs and stuff. So, if you want, you can come up to, just to talk, uh, discuss whatever. Swedish, English, French, German, Danish, and Norwegian works the best. <laughs> and Skånska. That's it. This dialect. In <laughs> okay. Thanks. Great.